Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm going to share some slides, so just let me know if you guys can see them. Everybody can see this? Yeah? Or... OK, it works, OK. Um, yeah, so we're going to be talking a little bit, um, some from the coding side, but also just about our experience with making physical um, pieces using machines and through like instructions that those understand and basically instruction-based textiles. Um, so I'm Luke. Um, I'm uh, originally an art blocks artist. I did the opera and orchids um, about 2021. And since then, I've been focusing on making physical generative art. And um, a big part of that has been working with the embroidery machine and um, trying to think of ways to combine generative art and fashion. Um, should I go? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Matt. Uh, I go by Numbers in Motion. Uh, super excited to be here today. Um, I um, my background is in math. I, st I studied math in college, and um, in a previous life, I I worked as a data scientist. Um, and since about 2021, I've been uh, I've been a practicing artist for full time. Um, I released a few projects on art blocks. I did a uh, one called Watercolor Dreams, <clears throat> and another one called Blaschke Ballet. And uh, since then, I have been working working as an artist, but also I've I've launched uh, a platform called Plottables, um, using the the art blocks technology stack. Um, it's essentially a platform for. Uh, for pin plotters, pin plotter artists, artists working with pin plotters. Um, it's exactly, the, the tech behind the platform is exactly the same as, as Artbox. So the, the code is hosted on chain and everything. Uh, the only difference is the, the code that's written by the artist, the output is an SVG. Um, and these SVGs contain um, you know, geometric instructions that, that robots holding pins can follow to recreate uh, the art. Um, and uh, more recently, uh, Luke and I have been working together to, to make a similar platform for embroidery machines, which uh, I'm very excited to talk about today. So, yeah. Yeah. So we're going to start with just some slides about generative fashion and generative textiles, and then um, we'll have a demo about converting, um, creating an SVG in code, but also if you are a digital artist who doesn't um, use code primarily or use code at all, you can also follow some of these steps to convert an SVG into an embroidery file and still be able to make a physical from that digital file. Um, so this is just the starting point examples, a digital um, generative digital project that I made on flowers. Um, and then this is that same algorithm, but Sorry, applied. Sorry, uh, Luke, I think your presentation is frozen. Uh, we're still looking at the oh. title slide, or at least I'm, I'm looking at the title slide. OK. Is that true for everybody else? Oh, Works it's now. working now. OK. Emma, if I go to the next slide, is this a different slide or no? Nope, we're still looking at the same. Um, Teacher uh, effect. Sure. Now we're looking at it. It might be the presentation mode, so I'll just stay in this mode um, for now. So this was the generative thing that I made, um, and this is that applied to address. So um, with generative fashion, the thing that really opens it up for us um, is this idea of the one of one of x, and um, that's kind of a real inspiring thing for us and the idea behind stitchables there's this effect when you're wearing the same shirt as somebody else when like you it's like kind of cool in the moment because you're like hey we have the same style and taste but also a little bit weird because 
you don't want to be wearing exactly the same thing as somebody else. You still want to have your own autonomy, individuality, kind of. And I think one of one of X and generative fashion in general has a really interesting um, concept for that area because you can be supporting the same artists, interested in the same ideas, expressing yourself in the same way, but also still have something totally unique. Um, another cool application of this is the instructions can be interpreted in many ways. So this would be like a digital print kind of piece, and this would be um, embroidered, sorry, no, woven uh, on a loom. So there's different ways to interpret the same set of instructions. Um, and this also I really like because it's um, kind of calls to some of the roots of programming in weaving and textiles and looms as being the first programmable machines. So in general, there's a really rich history of programming and textiles and programming and fashion and um, weaving. So we're excited about that. This is another woven textile, but purely digital. So this is me creating um, a digital textile by mimicking it purely in code. And this doesn't have a um, physical analog, just two directions to come with the same concept. And that back and forth um, the ability to interpret these things back and forth or translate them between code and then physical and then back to code and like sample images of fashion is another thing that I've done a little work with. It's really interesting to me um, specifically. Um, generative jewelry, this is just another brief overview of things you can do with code. Um, this is a generative beetle that I made for a necklace. Um, this is made in 3JS which we won't be talking about today, but if you are a coder and you're interested in making physical pieces like this and 3D printing them, you can send me a message, send me or Matt a message later. Um, and another interesting aspect um, is that this is an image, but it also could easily be a render, this right here. Um, and so there is a little bit of a question about whether or not it's real, real as being physical, and if that really means it's real. Um, and the image on the left maybe lends a little more credence to the idea that it's real, that it's in my hand, but that could also be faked. Um, and so another concept for digital fashion that we're interested in is um, the presentation of some of this, and I'm sure other um, lecturers are talking about this a lot, but um, the presentation of fashion in the digital space, the effect that something like Instagram has on um, the personas that we put forward and like what fashion means in that context. If you're only buying something to take a photo of yourself in it or take a photo of it and put it in a digital space, then that's a world where you're kind of already existing in the metaverse. And so we have a metaverse, metaversal relationship with some of our clothing, um, even if that clothing is purely physical, because we're only using it for the digital space. Again, I know some people who buy clothing just for an Instagram story or influencers will buy clothing just for an Instagram story and not wear it outside of that. And there's um, an artist doing some really interesting work in that area who, if anybody's interested, you can reach out to me after I embarrassingly forget the name right now. Um, this is what we're primarily going to be talking about. This is an embroidery machine executing instructions that, in this example, are generated by code but can be any SVG. And I really think of this, we really think of this as... Um, digital art. So it's fun to be able to experience digital art in this other kind of way and work with the machine in this other kind of way. Um, another reason that we are really excited about embroidery specifically is um, the ability to create patches and 
share the instructions for the embroidery online, um, for example, as tokens. And that has also some alignment with ideas of mendability with the patches or creating it yourself is um, often a really great way to reduce waste and outsourcing. Um, and all of these embroidered pieces can be put onto blanks for retail applications. And so um, there aren't, you know, thousands of the same t-shirt being printed that then, you know, if you misjudge the number that need to be printed as a store by only one, then you have all of these potentially unusable t-shirts. Um, here it's just the silhouette that can be embroidered on. So it's only generated and it's only um, sold if it's collected. Um, but the other question is, is there or a question that I have a lot um, and I think is important for the space in general is if there's a need for tokenization. This is an embroidered piece that I made um, that doesn't have a token attached at all. Uh, I still like it and wear it and I'm not sure that personally my enjoyment has um, been affected by that at all. Um, but it is different, I think, if I was collecting another artist's work, maybe. So it's just a area to think about. Um, this is a project that I did on um, manipulating a sewing pattern, a cutting pattern of uh, a coat and running an embroidery um, algorithm through it. So um, this goes back a little bit to what I was talking about in the beginning about weaving and pattern making as an instructions based project process. Um, and like there's all this technical language around sewing patterns that's so interesting to me because it really is a visual instructions based process and that aligns a lot with my um, practice and goes a little bit to the um, discussion on the roots of programming in fashion and textiles, actually, primarily. Um, this is the front and back of the same embroidery. Um, so what we're planning on sharing today is really low-level control of the embroidery machine. So um, in an SVG or in code, um, there are ways to make the embroidery machine follow exactly, explicitly your instructions. And um, the that is just not something you'll be able to get from embroidery digitizing software. You can um, control a lot of the parameters, but usually if you want to do like a really unusual fill or something that is um, a little more unusual for embroidery, like this piece, for example, these threads are, are really loose here. Um, that's something that is, to my understanding, not really as possible in embroidery digitizing software, uh, which does exist. So this is the back of some embroidery of Stitchables. Um, Matt and I recently had an event where we were had the embroidery machine running and we're doing flash generative embroidery in Marfa um, and made a bunch of these patches to give out. Um, and one of the other key challenges for this process is scaling. You know, this is, I don't know, maybe 80 total we made, maybe not even in this photo, but just 80 total. Um, and that was quite a process. Um, and so it was just us doing it, of course, but on one machine. Um, but the question of scaling is another interesting problem for one of one of X processes. And um, it's not necessarily a straightforward one. You know, I'm not sure that scaling is necessarily a good thing or like a desirable quality. Um, but it's something to think about. This is uh, two embroidery pieces um, showing some of the difference about designing um, code or SVGs specifically for embroidery. So for a fill pattern, 
um, the thread only fills in uh, a line, like the thread is a straight line. So if you want to fill a 2D shape, you have to come up with some kind of pattern for um, filling that shape with a line. And there's different um, densities you can do here. This is showing different densities, different stitch lengths as well, how that affects the shape of the circle and thinking about how those might overlap too. You get these ridges if all the stitches are in the exact same place. Um, so we'll be going maybe a little bit into some of those considerations. And if you're interested in doing an embroidery project, definitely please reach out to um, Matt or, or to me about how you might need to think about that project a little bit differently and some of the tips and tricks and stuff we've learned. Um, but the demo basically is going to be going from creating a digital file or having a digital file. Um, this is an example of that file in an interface maybe more people have seen, uh, Illustrator. And um, you can see in, in that file there are these nodes. Um, and basically the embroidery machine does a single stitch for each one of these nodes. So the spacing here, here for example, it'll be very dense because the nodes are very dense. and here they'd be, you know, a couple of millimeters. Um, so thinking about that process and all these translation steps to get to an embroidery file and then eventually from the embroidery file to the actual embroidered piece on the machine. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Matt and um, we can, we'll walk through some of those steps. Awesome. Maybe maybe we can also pause for a second for any questions oh, or anything. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of flew <laughs> through that. Are there any questions? Yeah. I guess not. Okay. Um, is there is there a place I can share a link? Is there a channel? There's a, a chat channel here. Um, Oh, here we go. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be going through some code here. Um, essentially, uh, wh what we're going to be doing is um, uh, using using P5 to create an SVG, and then I'll show you how to convert that SVG into um, a, a file format that an embroidery machine can understand. And then uh, I'll I'll turn my camera on and, and take you over to the embroidery machine and we'll uh, we'll stitch something out. Um, so uh, let me I'll share my screen and we can look at some code. Feel free to also open open it up yourself and follow along. But um, take a look. Hey, right. you should be seeing my screen. Is um, is that looking okay? I can also go like grandpa mode. Looks good for me. It's okay. Uh, sweet. Okay, so um, a lot of what I'm going to show here is um, is pretty manual. Um, I know Luke has been working on a a more general library um, that we'll use that that will take care of some of this. But uh, number one, I think it's important to um, to know sort of what's going on in the background when you're using a library. And number two, that the library isn't really public, li public yet, so uh, I, don't, I don't think we can quite share it uh, yet, but uh, yeah. Um, okay, so, um, so first, thing, first thing I want to do is set up the, the width and the height for my, my design. Um, this is going to be in millimeters, but um, it doesn't quite matter so much. Um, and then I want to set up the resolution. So you can think of this as like DPI kind of. Um, essentially, this is saying uh, 10 pixels will equal uh, one millimeter. Um, OK. And then if you're familiar at all with P5, um, we're going to go straight into the setup function. And we're going to do something kind of weird that you probably don't normally do with P5. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I don't want it to loop. Uh, so I'm going to say no loop, and I, I don't want to use a canvas. So I'm going to say no canvas. Normally, you would you would see something like uh, create canvas, and then you give it you know uh, your dimensions. But uh, since we're creating an SVG, 
uh, we are going to completely ignore the canvas and sort of make, make our image ourself. Um, so the first thing, uh, the first thing we want to do is create, create sort of this SVG object. Um, and we need this, we need to define a namespace for our SV object, SVG object. So, um, that's all this is really doing is, uh, create the SVG object. And then, um, all I'm going to do is set some attributes for our object. So, uh, I'm going to like define the width and the height right here. And then this view box is pretty important. This view box is sort of defining the, um, the geometric space that we'll be sort of operating in. Um, and you can see that I'm, I'm setting it at zero, zero, and then I'm looking at the, the resolution times the width and the resolution times the height. So let's just set up some attributes. And then I'm just giving it a background color. Um, and then we'll get our first look at how to like add stuff to the SVG. Uh, here I'm going to add a border. Um, and so when, when we want to add stuff to an SVG, we need to create a, another object to place inside of our SVG object. So here I'm creating a rectangle object, a rect object. And then uh, again, I'm going to set like the stroke and the stroke color. And then I'm going to give it a width and a height. And then the key part is I'm going to say for my SVG object, I want to append a child and I'm going to pass it the, the border. So really what this does, if I comment everything else out, um, this, I don't want to comment this out. Uh, you can't really see much, but it, it's actually creating a, a border around the, the outside edge. And uh, cool. Does that make sense? Uh, maybe we can pause and, and if there's any questions. Uh, also, feel free to, to write stuff in the chat if you have any questions. Uh, okay. If not, let's continue. Um, so, so now that we sort of know how to add stuff to our SVG, let's, let's try to add something a bit more complex. So a lot of the things that, that I work with, and, and I think that uh, you know, if, if you'll be making stuff with code for embroidery machines, you'll, you'll mostly use this, is, is what's called a path element. Um, let's, let's try to find some documentation. Uh, Um, so this path element in an SVG is, is quite a, uh, a complex thing. Um, it's, it's a way to define pretty much any shape you want. Um, and there are a lot of different ways of using this. Um, so you can like make lines, you can make uh, curves like Bezier curves, and there's like four different types of Bezier curves. Um, you can do arcs of circles and ellipses. Uh, and I think that's about it. But um, really what, what I'll stick to for now is just lines. Because uh, that's, that's essentially like all, all we're doing with the embroidery machine is we're making a line between one stitch and another stitch. Um, and so if we look at this code, what I want to do with this code is make a circle. I want to make a circle in a random place with a random radius. So what I first want to do is um, let's define where and how big the circle is. Um, so here I'm just defining uh, you know somewhere in our canvas and in, in our SVG. I'm going to place the circle and I'm going to give it a random radius. Uh, somewhere between five millimeters and 15 millimeters. Um, and then all I'm really doing is creating an array and I'm going to place the points for that circle inside that array. So I'm actually not even doing anything with the SVG here. I'm just uh, defining 
the geometry. Um, and here I'm just using you know, some, some standard like polar coordinate formulas, um, and I'm just sticking it into an array. And one of the, one of the maybe annoying parts of working with, with embroidery is um, if your stitches are too close to each other or too far apart, um, they can either be, you can either like break a needle if, if you're trying to embroider over the same spot too many times, or your threads will become loose and you'll be able to like stick a finger under the thread and like you could break it or, or it's, it's, it becomes very delicate at that point. So one, one of the things you want to do when working with embroidery and code is make sure that your points, your stitch points are, are evenly spaced. So normally you want to aim for like one millimeter between each stitch. So, so I've written some, I've written a, a little function down here, uh, resample line by spacing, to take this geometry that I've just defined, and I haven't really cared about how close points are to each other, and just resample it so that things are um, spaced nicely and evenly and will embroider nicely. Um, so here I'm calling that function, and I'm going to pass it my geometry, my polyline that I've defined, and then I'm going to pass it also a parameter that that tells me uh, how close or, or how far I want these stitches to be resampled by. So here, uh, because I'm using the resolution, it'll be one millimeter. As I said, uh, you know, 10, 10 pixels is one millimeter. So here, resample to Evenly base out the stitches. Okay. And then I'm going to take that new geometry and I'm going to create a path, um, just as I created the border before. So I'm going to create a path object. I'm going to set its fill and stroke. And then uh, one weird thing about paths uh, is that if we go and look at this, um, if we look at an example, let's see. Um, it, it uses this weird syntax where you have, a, you have a command and then you have some, some coordinates, another command and coordinates, another command and some coordinates. And uh, we need to recreate this string using our geometry. Um, and the way that we, the way that I like to do that is, is first create the object, and then uh, create the path string. So each path string starts with an M, and that's essentially that's telling that's telling the SVG I want to move to this point. So here I'm moving to the first point in our resampled polyline. And then all I'm going to do is loop through all of the other points, starting at 1, because I already used 0. I'm going to start at 1 and loop through the rest of our points, and I'm going to add a line to that point. So I'm adding on to the string here, plus equal, and I'm, I'm saying from my last point, I want to make a line to this next point. And what we end up with is a string, a really long string, that contains all of that geometry. Um, and if we want to look, I have, I have a, an example here. This, this mm -hmm. uh, everything from here to, let's see, to here, that is, that is the string that we are creating right there. So it's a very, very long string, but all it's really doing is saying move to this point and then make a line to this point and a line to this point and a line to this point. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's actually quite simple. It looks, it looks complicated and long, but it's, um, it's not so scary. <laughs> uh, and then I'm taking that string and I'm, I'm setting it as the, the D attribute, uh, which if we go back here is, the, is this, um, this path parameter that, that takes in the string. So actually set the root. String. 
And then all we have to do now is append the path to the SVG. And then at the very end, we append the SVG to our, uh, our HTML. Um, so if we run this real quick, uh, we should see a new circle appear. Okay. And the nice thing is, uh, because we set up our x, y, and radius to be random, uh, every time we, we rerun this, it'll be in a different, different place with a different radius. And uh, one of the beautiful things about computers is if you have them do one thing, uh, they can easily do that thing multiple times. So here I'm just I'm just telling it to do do that same thing, make a make a random circle in a random place ten times. So now we just have a bunch of circles. And they randomly generate. Um cool. Okay, so the last part is okay, so we've built this SVG. We can actually go in to our HTML and we can like we can inspect. I don't know if you can see that very well, but we can we can see the actual SVG in our in our HTML. But uh, the easiest way to actually get this SVG out of the browser and and make a file out of it, um, just using this um, this weird JavaScript thing called a an XML serializer, uh, it'll take an SVG and it'll spit out spit out the the string that is that SVG. So. Um, Write the SVG string to the console. Okay. And now here's our giant string with 10 circles. And we can copy this. And we can go over and we can paste that into a, a document. We can save it. So now I have I have this I have these circles that I just made. I can I now have it as an SVG and I can I can open this up in like Inkscape or Illustrator or something. And we should see the same thing. There we go. about right things are things are sort of hanging over the edge but that's okay um okay so now we have we have our svg but embroidery machines don't understand svgs uh they understand i mean it depends on your embroidery machine but uh they are usually proprietary uh, file formats so for the machine I have, I have a brother machine right next to me. Um, brother machines use something called PES. Uh, yeah, good, good point, Luke, yes. Um, so brother machines use something called PES, and um, there are a few different ways to get your SVG into that format. Uh, the one that we've been using is something called VPipe. Um, and VPipe is uh, a very useful tool, but it's, uh, it runs in the, the terminal or in the console. So it's a bit intimidating if, if you don't have a lot of coding experience. But um, if you're running on, if you're on a Mac, um, you, you should have a program called Terminal. Um, and what you want to do is install something called VPipe, and then install something called VPipe Embroidery. Uh, which, if you if you're unsure how to do that, or if you want uh, want some help with that, Luke and I would be happy to to help you out with that process. It's it's a bit intimidating again, but um, it's it's not so bad. Um, so yeah, so so we have we have our SVG. We have this program that will convert the SVG into a PES file. Um, and really, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this command. Uh, vpipe read our SVG, and then ewrite embroidery write dot um, uh, pes file. So when I run this command, 
I now have a PES file to go along with my SVG. And um, again, there are, there are many, many different softwares that uh, will help you read PES files. Um, many softwares that will like, help you digitize things directly if you don't want to use code or Illustrator. But uh, the one I've been using is called Chroma. Chroma. Um, I'm using the trial version because the, uh, the full version costs like $1,500 for some reason. Uh, but it is, it is pretty nice. Um, and what I can do is I can take this PES file and I can drag it in here. And now we see all of our circles. So the only thing left now is to put our file onto a USB drive, uh, plug it into our embroidery machine, and uh, press run. Uh, so I'm going to turn my camera on. We will take a look at the embroidery machine. Uh, I'm going to put this file onto my USB drive. And we are going to go for a field trip over to the other side of my office. All right. <laughs> um, okay. So. I'm going to try to set this up nicely. <laughs> How's that look? <laughs> OK, so I'm going to plug my USB drive into my machine. I'm going to pull up my pattern here. I don't know if you can see that very well, but we can now see the, the circles on the screen. I have my hoop set up with some thread. All right, and I think we're ready. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna press go and cross my fingers. How's that looking? <laughs> Looks good. Um, awesome. So I'll let that go. But um, in the meantime, uh, if you have any questions about the code or, or anything, uh, happy to talk. Um, I also have a few other code examples if you're interested in, in more complex things. So um, there, there are a lot of like, there are a lot of techniques that uh, like, 
sorry, this is really loud, um, that like traditional embroidery uses. Um, there, there's a lot of different stitch types, and Luke, Luke kind of touched on this a bit, but um, a lot of the work that we've been doing for in preparation of, of the launch of Stitchables has been trying to translate those those ideas into into code and into tools that artists can use. Um, so if you're if you're interested, um, there's things like satin stitches and uh, tatami fills and and all of these all of these cool things that that we're working on code to to reproduce. So um, yeah, we have some examples that we can go through, but uh, yeah, curious curious what you think or if you have any questions. Hi, uh, my name is Joyce. Can you hear me? Yeah. Your work, I'm just flawed. I am speechless. I am lost. Uh, <laughs> firstly, to start off with, um, I have a background in, in embroidery and I actually own an embroidery machine that does, I've got 15 colours. So I, and, and, <laughs> I, I'm digital. The digital space for me is. Um, phenomenal in the sense that how we can reduce waste. You've touched upon um, waste reduction and my work is all about looking at landfills and reimagining how we recreate the physical things and using AI to reduce that. So I, I, I'm just floored by your work. My approach to embroidery is using programs like Wilcom um, or Hatch and using Illustrator. So you have your patterns, you upload and then you digitize. But how you've created it, I am so intrigued. So I, I definitely love to reach out with you, um, reach out to you, and and see even if it's a collaborative project. Because the embroidery machine that I'm actually looking at in front of me, I can embroider up to a meter wide. Um, I did it for my masters. Yeah, I with my masters I specialize in embroidery, uh, gravity sketch, and like bridging all those physical and digital. So just seeing your what you've just, I'm I'm flawed. I have no words. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> that that machine sounds amazing and uh yes we, we would we would love to, to work together uh, um uh yeah uh happy, happy you like it and uh yeah we'd, we'd love to chat amazing I'll, I'll send a picture of it in the in the in the group please, please do <laughs> uh, I've, been, I've been like doing so much research on the different machines and and the different like uh, digitizing software and everything but um, I'm always in awe of like the giant industrial machines with with like 15 different heads. Um, it's uh, it makes me sad that I live in New York and I I can't like go buy a a giant warehouse to keep these giant machines in. Oh, the it's it's uh, it's one head, but it has up to 15 different colors, so you can um, interchange it. Yeah, nice. but the okay. ones the ones that 15 different heads, that's when you're doing yeah. like mass production. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to jump in. That's amazing. <laughs> we definitely would be happy to talk and yeah, want to see the machine and your work sounds really cool as well. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> we got some circles. <laughs> um, yeah, usually usually after it's done, there's like some just a bit of cleanup, some loose loose threads. And depending on oh my gosh, that machine's beautiful. Uh, depending on the type of machine you have, sometimes you'll have like some jump stitches that you might have to trim. But um, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. <laughs>
Everybody just reacting to the machine is so great. <laughs> That's how I feel about coding. So I'm like, what? <laughs> um, honestly, these these are the type of types of collaborations that I think we're most excited about is is talking talking to the people that maybe don't have a lot of coding experience but have a lot of embroidery mix experience and um, learn learning learning from each other. You know, how how can we how can we make tools? that um, you know make for better embroidery files and and how can we how can we help people who are traditionally less less have less coding experience how, how can we make tools that are that make it easier for them to to use code to to make embroidery yeah um what i use my machine for is footwear so my, yeah, my embroidery stems into footwear. So the, the final collection at uni was that. And yeah, I, my work, the embroidery was a lot more dense and I embroidered onto leather. Um, so yeah, it'd just be interesting to see the breadth of the machine. Two sides, one can do cording and sequins, but I haven't used those two. I just use the, the simple area of it, but it's just the dream between the digital and the real. And do we actually have to create the final outcome? Can we use generative AI or 3D modeling to give you the perceived image of what this thing could be? Um, and then once there is a demand for this object or item, then you can then manufacture. So yeah, I completely love what you're doing and yeah, I would love to work with you in any way. That sounds amazing. Yeah, super cool. We definitely we want um, some kind of future where there are these kinds of machines in more shops. And yeah, we don't have to be um, guessing on demand for sustainability reasons. Uh, you, you want to take this one, Luke? I mean, I think I got into fashion through uh, through you. <laughs> I found out about embroidery through you, uh, and you know, obviously, I've I've gone down a deep dark hole. But <laughs> um, for me, I got interested in generative art um, maybe five years ago or so. And um, I had been making other kinds of art before then, but um, I also had, yeah, this interest in math um, and coding and then finally found generative art and that combined those for me. Um, and then that bridge to embroidery, um, I, I found, or one of my friends found, this broken embroidery machine um that wasn't really being used and we fixed it up and then started doing a couple embroideries and then because of my interest in generative art i wanted to see if i could make embroidery files directly from code and that's a thing that people have done so um it was really fun to work with and then it just kind of became a deeper and deeper rabbit hole to like trying to make tools and trying to share this more widely um i think in general um there's always been a big overlap like like i said the history of um programming or instructional art and, and weaving or um and looms i think is um not um not talked about as much as it should be for how central it is in, in my view um so to me they actually kind of naturally go together a lot of the language of um some of the instructional side of fashion and a lot of the constraints like 
I think fashion has a lot of constraints in general, and that's the most useful thing for creativity for me. Um, and a constraint like somebody needs to be able to wear this is actually can be a very productive constraint on like being able to then be creative within that or like breaking that sometimes and code and creating those kinds of additional constraints on what can be output is a natural analog. Um, another question here on different stitches techniques. Matt, do you have some examples? Yeah, I got um, I got a few examples. So so what we just what we just saw with the circles is um, I, I think it's called like a a run stitch, a running stitch, and it, it's essentially just a line. And so here here are a bunch of a bunch more examples of of that. Um, and let's see. So here's a here's a good example. This one wasn't made with code, but um, this is like what you might see for a patch. And so this this border here is called a satin stitch. So essentially, it's just like a, a zigzag uh, back and forth uh, very tightly. And then the infill, the fill, is called a tatami stitch. And uh, tatami stitches are really cool and really, really hard to reproduce in code. Um, but uh, it, it's a great way to to fill to fill a large space, and it, it looks really nice. Um, let's see, I have a bunch of examples. Here's uh, here's here's an example of one of the the patches we made in in Marfa, um, and this this satin stitch around the edge. Uh, this was actually made with code, uh, so that was that was a lot of fun. Uh, let's see. Uh, here is an example of one one I made from one of my one of my algorithms, and then a smaller version of that with like a tatami fill. It's uh, it's a bit smaller, but so here the squares are just filled filled with like a tatami stitch. Um, I, I hope I hope that answers the uh, the stitch technique question. That's, those are all all the ones that I have off off offhand. But um, it, it sounds like Coco might have a question as well. Hey guys, how's it going? Um, thanks for coming on today. It's been really really cool to see your guys' work. Uh, I come from. Um, not so a technical or generative background, uh, mainly making uh, seamlessly repeating print, uh, digital print, um, with a variety of different techniques, but all for the purpose of uh, printing on fabric. Um, I usually print, you know, direct to fabric, wet washable, uh, digital printing. Um, so I was curious to ask if you guys had any experience with printing. Uh, even you know, perhaps on embroidery or or not, um, with a seamless technique in which you're generating a, a pattern or a print uh, that has no edges and um, that could lend itself to a more scalable application. Um, I, I think we we've both experimented a bit with with printing. Uh, like direct direct to garment, I think is what it's called, DTG. Um, I probably have less experience than than Luke does on that front, but I can go find find a, an example of something I've done. I have I have my example of some direct to garment from a a generative pattern, um, and this is a some this is actually from that same um, flowers algorithm that I showed in the beginning of the slides. Um, and I've um, experimented a little bit with creating kind of like um, seamless patterns, but I haven't um, used that for fashion at all yet. Um, one thing that I have done is uh, for the embroidery machine, um, because I, <laughs> I 
have never had access to a machine quite so large as, as Joyce's. I um, have written some code to split embroidery files kind of in half. So then um, I can embroider in one section and embroider right below it. So in that sense, kind of tile embroideries. Um, but never with, I think, something quite like you're describing, which sounds really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, I mean, my, my, my mind's racing now, but so, I, yeah, I think what would be cool would be like, you know, this is, this is a, a print that was, that was uh, put directly onto the shirt. Um, I forget the, the actual name of the process, but what would be amazing would be to do this and then embroider on top of it. And so you you could combine different techniques and um, even even have the have the the print and the embroidery sort of uh, play off each other and interact. Um, I think that would be incredible and, and amazing. And please do it. <laughs> Sublimation printing. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Um, Victoria has a question about dimensional embroideries. There, there are some, there are some materials that you can you can add to your embroidery to like give it a three D. Um, I have I have some of this. It's called puffy foam. <laughs> uh, essentially, what you do is is you you place it down on the fabric while it's embroidering, and it, it just gives it a, a bit of extra um, you know thickness that the 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 uh the thread can like can go over and it, and it gives it like a, a nice um bold look i haven't i, I haven't also, gotten to use it yet but i also have here um a piece that's embroidered but like really i'm not sure if it really shows up but kind of absurdly densely it's like a real tangle on some of these points um I'm kind of a fan of these like messy embroideries too, these messy patches. Um, and this is a, a spring simulation in code, um, which is how fabric is modeled in um, in like three d programs as a as a fabric of um, springs as a network. Um, and it's really cool to to do something like this. Um, and go from the digital file to the real thing because in the digital file there's no dimensionality whatsoever really it's just like a big red area but in this you get a lot of interesting things that come out like these points and some of this 3d-ness that's showing up um, so that's one of the like translations that um, I was talking about a little bit where you get a totally new um, direction and dimension when you're using a different medium or different process. P5.js definitely counts. That's what I use for everything. So there's actually also, um, if you're interested in P5.js, I'm going to drop a link in the chat here that you can just add comma SVG to create canvas and it will convert all the p5.js things like the built-in circle function built-in rectangle function that kind of stuff to um svg code so the output of that when you save it will be an svg um it makes it uh so you don't have to deal with a lot of some of the more technical stuff we were getting into today um i'll drop that link just now and Joyce is asking if you can feed a pre-existing image into code so it recreates a new embroidery design. Um, there, are, there are people that are working on tools that, that will do that. Um, I don't know the names off the top of my head. Um, I, I haven't used it, um, but it, it's certainly possible. I think... Um, I think you know for someone for someone like sitting down to write a tool that that does that I think there's a lot of artistic choice that needs to be made and so if you're using a tool like that maybe you don't have so much control over what it looks like but if you're just looking to get uh, an image into an embroidery file onto a garment definitely possible 
And uh, I, can, I can do some research and, and try to find that, that tool that I've seen in the past. Uh, I don't know if Luke, Luke has any, any other inputs on that. I think just in general, it's certainly possible to take in an image in code and then manipulate that image somehow um, to create an embroidery design pattern. So like, um, if you're speaking differently from the, the digitizing software, I've made some sketches that um, take in an image, even from the webcam, and um, output a embroiderable file from that. Or you could use audio. Like um, code is a great medium for me, and because um, it, a lot of these machines at the end of the day have to speak code. Like webcams and embroidery machines and images they all like have some kind of digital definition which usually boils down to some kind of data or instruction set um and so there usually is um a great way to work between them and translate between a lot of them um yeah if if you have if you're interested in in talking more um please reach out yeah thank you i was just even thinking just like a symbol like if, if a brand came to you and they said can you use generative ai to uh, yeah create uh, an alternative to a symbol or a shape and what would that look like so yeah i'll definitely reach out thank you yeah i, I think that would be um doable for for our process it would probably be um looking at it and trying to figure out the rules and then writing um code without ai but like generative code to create a range that's in the same kind of vein but each one is unique um but i think i think i'm sure some people are working on generative ai embroidery as well along along those kinds of veins In general, um, if anybody doesn't have any experience coding and wants to get into something like this from the coding perspective, Matt's recommendation of the coding train on YouTube, Dan Schiffman, um, is a really great one and one that I've used a lot to learn um, coding. And um, if you are interested in doing that and want to reach out to us, we can create a setup that will start with some of this svg stuff built in so whatever you create um following those tutorials will also be embroiderable Please feel free to ask any more questions. I mean, uh, we've got 20 minutes until the scheduled end of our session. So um, if there's anything you'd like to ask about, I suppose, like embroidery or generative um, embroidery in general, um, gen generative coding as well. I do know there are a couple of people here who are into generative coding, but not so much into the physical production side. Um, I'm sure they would be happy to answer questions about that as well. Maybe, um, yeah, of course, then ask some questions, right? <laughs> yeah, please feel free to ask any questions at any kind of level. Um, one thing that we also should mention is um, the platform we're working on, Stitchables, um, basically takes all of this tech and bundles it um, into a Artblocks engine type platform um, that allows for people to upload code and then each mint from that collection to be unique and embroidered. And so right now we're working out with 
um, like how to make those manufacturable too, like or working with trying to find people to help us um, manufacture these at scale so that collectors can mint and get the NFT and the instructions embroidered themselves if they'd like to, if they have an embroidery machine, um, but also get a physical in the mail right away. And like, we see that as a great way of really tying together um, physical and the digital, and especially introducing this one of one of X generative fashion. So if there's any coders interested in learning more about that, reach out to us as well. Or non-coders. I could I could talk about plotters for days. Um yeah. Yeah, so I got into pen plotting, um, gosh, like six or seven years ago. I got my first Axie draw, and um, I had been, I had been making uh, generative art for for a couple years at that point, and was was just tired of looking at it on the screen, and and wanted wanted a way to bring it into the real world. Um, and I knew that I knew some people that were working with Axie draws. And uh, decided to get one and changed my life. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's it's a if you're if you're familiar at all with with like how you would code for like Canvas or or how you like normally think about coding in in P five or or with pixels. Um, working with plotters can be a bit uh, different. It takes it takes some time to like figure out a workflow. Um, mainly mainly because you're working with SVGs. So it's it's actually a very similar workflow to what we went over today, where you you use code to create an SVG. Um, but I don't know. I, I found I found that way of working um, really really freeing, and uh, I, I loved I loved watching the plotter like do its work for like three hours straight without without complaining or anything. Uh, it's a it's a super meditative experience for me and um and hypnotic and and uh yeah I, I i just love it a lot and that that was that was the main reason that i went on to build the plottables platform was um, i saw i saw this stuff happening with with nfts and generative art and uh, it didn't it didn't feel like people working with pin plotters had a had a space where they could participate in that in that conversation and uh yeah so i built plottables and uh, been having a lot of fun. <laughs> My pin plotter collection has grown quite a bit. Um, but yeah. yeah. Matt is plotter extraordinaire. Number one. Um, for like for reference, for people that may not have seen a pen plotter before, this is a pen plotter machine. So it holds a pen right here. And um, you can write code or run SVGs that move this arm around. So that if you can imagine this on a piece of paper, it, it can draw basically any shape. Um, and this, um, something that I've used a little bit in fashion as well. This is a, a jacket of mine that has um, some plotted designs coming out of fabric pens on a patch. Um, and so, it's also totally feasible to use something like the plotter for um, fashion in, in these other kinds of ways. Or, um, yeah, as maybe cut, uh, laying out the lines to cut for a pattern. Um, that's, a, that's a very good point. Um, we should explain the difference between SVGs and vectors versus images and pixels. So. Um, an image with pixels is basically um, a big grid, like each pixel is a point on a grid, um, or like a little square on a grid that has a color associated with it. So basically, an image is just specifying the color of every single one of those points 
and then together um you see an image kind of as a whole but then when you zoom in sometimes too much on an image you can start to see the pixels um because it's just these little blocks of color and um there's not necessarily any intrinsic data about what the shape is there for example if it's a circle um then everything inside the circle could be a black pixel and everything outside could be a white pixel um but the pixels themselves don't really know what a circle is something like that so um there's not really a, a way to to in order to make that um usable for a machine we have to kind of get some information there about the the path we want the machine to take so svgs are kind of the opposite of that i mean they are exactly the same images like you could see we were producing images um but rather than the data in an svg being the colors for all the pixels um it's defining paths for a pen to travel or for the computer to follow when it's making something so um for an svg if you wanted to do a circle rather than defining these pixels as black and these pixels as white you would say i want a circle in this position of this radius and then um the computer when it's rendering that svg when it takes the svg and is converting it to something you can see will go through the process of following those instructions and like drawing a circle and so um when you zoom in on the border of the circle for example um there isn't going to be any pixelation there because the computer can continuously um convert the image from this instruction to like a perfect border there so it has some underlying data underlying data about the shapes that should be in the image um and so when you plot an svg or embroider an svg which by the way stands for scalable vector graphics so that's where like scalability comes from you can zoom into an svg infinitely without losing resolution and the instructions are usually based off of vectors um but that underlying data is something that the machines can follow in order to um have a path to embroider on or to plot on um and if there are there are a lot of um resources online it probably would have been better to do that with some visuals but um there are some some examples online of of differences there as well um and we're happy to answer any more questions um for genart.studio your question i'm actually not sure of any for on chain one of ones i i would think um i one of my uh projects i actually did do as a one of one um on artbox because i wanted it to the code to be on chain in that way it was actually on the plotables contract so thank you matt um and so it is possible to use something like artbox for just doing one piece um they artbox themselves probably wouldn't they have like a uh, somewhat of a curation process and they're looking for more long form stuff but there are some open versions of artblocks that probably you could look into um maybe like prohibition maybe would is i think like a no barrier fx hash and you can upload your code and get something on chain i'm not i'm not sure if fx hash is on chain in the same way um as artblocks but I'd look into one of those kinds of things that also supports long form and then just restricting your output set to one mint. Um, just to touch on what you were saying before about um, SVGs, um, we've talked about plotters and embroidery machines, but there are there are other ways you can um, you can take an SVG and make it something, make something physical out of it. Um, like you can use a laser cutter. I know, I know, Luke's been Luke's been doing a bit of experimentation with laser cutters lately. I got um, some examples in a second. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to see it. <laughs> um, you can do laser cutters. You can do like three D printers. Um, 
yeah, it's it's a it's a really interesting and and new and involving area of of exploration that I think a lot of people are are just starting to explore. Um, so I only have a couple pieces like next to me right now, um, but this is like something that's laser cut, um, and these paths can all be defined in code. These are all SVG paths. So this same file, for example, I could embroider or plot or laser cut using SVG files. So they're really like one of the canonical ways to represent these kinds of instructions. Um, so this is with laser cutter. Also, I just have a couple kind of artifacts. Um, 3D printing too, you can like extrude. These are just parts of pieces that I'm working on. But this is all, um, this can be done with SVG as well, like extruding SVG. Um, I have this here, actually. CNC machines, yes, exactly. Um, this here is a ceramic piece that I worked on, which this shape is an SVG that I define in code and then extruded in code and then use a ceramic 3D printer to make. So SVG is at the core of this as well. Um, and I've thought also about using the laser cutter for some fashion experiments. Um, you can laser cut fabric or there's some machines that um, hold a knife to cut fabric. So um, like some patterns will be cut that way. Or um, I've thought about generating some designs and then laser cutting or cutting those out and making some kind of piece of clothing out of all of those patches. Um, yeah, it's a very flexible way to work and, and translate. Embroidery has got a, a special place in my heart, though. <laughs> and again, everything we're doing with SVGs um, or with code to create SVGs can be done with SVGs created in another way, like through Adobe Illustrator and stuff. So um, if you don't have any experience with using some of these tools, but want to be making some physical work and think you can maybe find access to a machine through a makerspace or um, a friend or any kind of resources you might have access to, then please reach out, um, we can try to help you figure out how to do that translation step. That's a, that's a good question. That's something that we've been struggling with a bit lately. Um, so we, I, I know Luke, Luke is in Princeton and has access to, to quite a few tools. Um, I, have, I have my own embroidery machine and a few plotters, um, but I, I, don't, I don't think we, we really have the, the tools necessary for like large scale production of things. 
And so that's that's something we've been we've been working on lately is is figuring out a partner to work with to um, to produce all of the all of the garments for for our new platform. Um, and it's it's been quite a struggle actually. <laughs> Um, a lot of a lot of production companies for embroidery are used to getting like a single embroidery file and making a hundred or a thousand uh, t-shirts or or whatever from it. And when we come to them and say we're going to have five hundred different patterns and we want one one piece from each of them, they uh, they either laugh at us or tell us tell us it's going to be like eight hundred dollars for a t-shirt. Um, so, so that, that's, that's, uh, it's an issue that we've been, we've been really struggling with lately. We have, um, a few leads, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we're good on questions, I think, actually. Um, so I think we could probably wrap up this session about two minutes earlier than expected. That's all right with everyone. Um, but yeah, I will, I'll, wait, I'll wait another 30 seconds in case like anybody wants to type out any more questions. But if not, like, uh, you know, thank you so much for coming to this session, um, Luke and Matt. Thank you so much for sharing us um, and also offering, like, you know, beyond the session, like help for residents and contact for residents who are interested in um, combining these two aspects of practice. Um, what would be the best way for residents to reach out to you? Um, email, Twitter, Discord? <clears throat> Yeah, I'll post their, um, oh, perfect, yeah. Great, great. Yeah, a couple, couple of contact details, um, and, Thank you so much for, for tuning in and asking a bunch of questions. Um, really appreciate people engaging and hope it was helpful. Um, please reach out with any more questions either on this or um, anything <laughs> semi-related. Um, it's been really fun speaking and thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Take care. Thank you.